I read ancient texts. They could be biblical texts, they could be texts you dig up out of the ground, inscriptions, anything that we could call uh, a written text. And archaeology and statistics meet. Uh, now, the meeting of archaeology and text is not that unusual because we have artifacts. Archaeology is formally defined as the material evidence of the human past. So what is it humans have left behind anciently? Anciently is defined usually as 1798 for some reason in most European cultures. So if it's 19th century, it doesn't count yet as uh, archaeology, I guess it's just include. Uh, we don't have the clickers, so I'm going to just say next, next, next. Uh, we're going to talk quickly about three subjects, Qumran, I'll explain what that is, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, you've probably heard of that. Qumran's where they were found. A cave that I worked on and discovered with a colleague back in the year 2000, and then some Jerusalem tombs. So I'm giving you three examples as we're advertising. I want to mention my personal blog, jamestabor.com, so if you can remember my name. It has over 800 uh, posts, and a lot of them are full-length published articles, all sorts of things. Uh, it's pretty, gets a lot of traffic. It's one of the top 10 biblio blogs, I think they call them. But you can see I, I titled it, a religion, religion Matters from the Bible to the Modern World. So that lets me do anything I want, really. Okay, <laughs> all right. So in looking at texts and material evidence, stats will be at the end, um, what I want to stress for students and for colleagues is the idea of trying to ask what the facts are. I mean, it sounds pretty basic for scientists, but believe me, in humanities, uh, we need this lesson because people come up with so many theories and interpretations, and you have to ask, you know, in our political system, don't we talk now, we have this big debate about, well, those are your facts and these are my facts. But we should be able to agree, uh, whether you're looking at texts or material evidence, what something is and what was found and when it was found, if possible, and then what we might say about it. And then interpretation, of those facts. Now that can of course vary, that would be the second level. What do we make of those facts? I'll give you illustrations as we go. And then hypotheses and spe even speculations, and a hypothesis to some degree can be a speculation. And I'm going to illustrate all of these as we go. Okay. So uh, we might put the lights down slightly. Do you know how to do that, Andrew? Because um, I'm thinking um, I don't want it to be pitch dark, but just so some of these will show up really well. This is an aerial shot. I'm not going to tell you how I took it. That's a joke. Look, look, look at the vantage point. <laughs> I didn't take it. Uh, a helicopter took it. But this is the city of ancient Jerusalem. And the reason I wanted you to look at this, because if you look to the east, you can actually see the Dead Sea on a clear day. And I'm going to be talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls first. So the Dead Sea Scrolls were found uh, 13 miles from the city of Jerusalem. As the crow flies, the road goes winding down. You go from 2,400 feet above sea level to 1,300 feet below. It's the lowest spot on earth, the Dead Sea. And there it is right there. Nothing lives in that. It's so full of uh, not only salt, but other minerals. And next. Um, these two maps, there's Jerusalem, and this is the Dead Sea. If you go just uh, across from Jerusalem, due east, you will get to Qumran. This is a close-up of Qumran. And in 1947, in caves around Qumran, Qumran is just the name of the ancient settlement. It's a ruin. It's an archaeological site uh, where found these scrolls. I don't know how much you know about the Dead Sea Scrolls, but for somebody in my field, it's the ultimate because these are 2,000 year old texts. They're from before the time of Jesus, and they are the library of a religious Jewish sect of the time. They were an apocalyptic messianic sect. 
They talked about the new covenant and they practiced baptism and they did all sorts of things that are very close to what the Christians later do. So you can imagine the interest this caused among both Christians and Jews. So I want to talk more about the archaeology of Qumran, not the scrolls. I could come and tell you lots about the scrolls that you use. Courses on them. Okay, next. This is uh, where it all started. This is cave one up in the hills. I'll get some other shots where you get some perspective. That's me quite a few years ago. Look at the color of my hair. And cave one was discovered by Bedouin shepherds. Nobody knew what would be in this cave. The story is that a sheep wandered into the cave. I really doubt that because this was all blocked up and I doubt if the sheep climbed up here and jumped in, but maybe. I think they were probably treasure hunting and the scrolls were in these clay jars and one of them threw a rock in, his name was Muhammad el Dib. he threw a rock in, he heard a clash and he thought, oh, treasure. And uh, actually that, it was treasure, but not gold or silver. Next. This is an aerial shot of the ruin of Qumran and the caves are all around. There's some of the caves here, some are here, and some are back off the screen. So I want to ask the question, if I have texts, I'm reading the Dead Sea Scrolls about this community from the first century BCE, uh, how would I connect this settlement with the people that wrote the scrolls? Because the caves are close, but no scrolls were ever found at Qumran. And so this is actually going to be a very simple example. If everything was this easy, I would be very happy. It's not. But I'm going to show you how I was able, uh, I think, to satisfactorily answer the question of, are the people who wrote these scrolls, that religious group, that sectarian group, is this their spiritual headquarters? Is this where they actually live? And if you just look at it, it's got cisterns, and it's got aqueducts for water, and it's got different storage rooms, but nothing really that you could say, oh, this is a religious community. Some people think it's a monastery, but others have suggested it's a country villa or a manufacturing plant, you know. And since no scrolls were found in the settlement, it's sort of been up for debate. So I'll show you how I thought of a way to try to uh, do this. Okay, next. This is uh, an artist's uh, reconstruction of what it might have looked like. You come in here, there's a ritual pool of immersion right there. It's called a mikvah. If any of you are Jewish, you'd be familiar with this. Christians would call it baptism, but in Judaism, you go through the ritual cleansing for any number of reasons, not just to be a member of the religious group. So the fact that that ritual pool is right there on the Northwest as you're coming in and out of the community does say something about the possibility. It's probably a religious community because they're thinking that this enclosure is therefore sacred. It's got a wall around it, and when you go in and out, this is the only way in and out, and you've got to dip in the pool, which means you've entered kind of a temple idea. Now, this is still a hypothesis, right? We'd have to prove it, but I mean, I, mean, I think it's pretty likely. Next. This is just to show you what those scrolls look like. Uh, the worms and decay eat a little bit of them, but this one is in fabulous shape. An Israeli kid, uh, say fourth grade kid, could read that fluently even today. It's called Herodian script, very, very close to our Hebrew script today. Next. This is a, a page of Isaiah. A complete copy of the book of Isaiah was found. It's, I mean, in my field, it's the most valuable material object on earth. It's from 200 BC. So some of you probably come from Christian backgrounds. I mean, I tell my students this, it's unlikely, but if Jesus visited this community, this would have been their copy of Isaiah. He well could have picked this scroll up and read from it, this very scroll, because it existed in that time. Typically, you keep scrolls for 200 years, 300 years, even today, Torah scrolls and synagogues. I'm also interested in, this is the science part, I won't talk about it today, but there are thumbprints. Uh, and the question now is, can paleo DNA be recovered from ancient thumbprints or just the fact that there's a thumbprint? There are also little marks in the margin occasionally where somebody has marked their Bible, so to speak, which is sort of interesting. Okay? 
So the first thing, I didn't do this, but the first thing that uh, someone else did, and then I'll tell you what I personally did, was that these are tombs. So this, uh, my laser pointer's kind of edging up here. This is the settlement, and this is 1,100 tombs that you can see that are just to the east. And you usually put your burial area outside the camp of where you're living, because death is seen as contamination in most anthropological systems. So in the scrolls, one of the things that's very striking is that the community of priests that leads this group lives a celibate life. Now, we don't know celibacy anywhere in the Western world until the Roman Catholic Church, until this was found. And now we have a Jewish group that is practicing celibacy, meaning the non-married life, all male community. You could say, oh, they were monks. These are Jews from 200 BC. I don't think we should call them monks. What we're doing is discovering something new about the origins of Judaism and Christianity. Now, why would they live a celibate life? Because they believe the end is very, very near. They're an apocalyptic messianic group, and they're beginning to think they're the last generation and the people that are committed to living at the spiritual headquarters actually don't uh, get married. So about 40 of these graves were open uh, over the years. Go ahead, Lori. Show you up close. This is what they look like. Uh, there's one that's been open. You can see there. And uh, go ahead. This is the skeleton. They're basically six feet under. And no grave goods, nothing. It's uh, you're wrapped in your prayer shawl and you're simply buried, and the bones are still intact and pretty much in the desert. So what did this tell us? What we began to see: 1,100 with 40 being. This is your first stat. If you do a random sampling of 40 of 1,100 and they're all male, could we say that the cemetery is an all male cemetery? I'd say it's pretty likely. We'd have to dig up all the rest to absolutely prove it, right? But most of us are convinced it's all male. Now, three females were found on the very edge, and that kind of blew the theory for a while, but they had beads and bracelets, which these guys don't have. And it turns out that they were Bedouin burials probably from 300 years ago. So. Bedouins that live in the desert saw this cemetery and thought, hey, you know, some ancient people buried here, we'll bury, we'll bury our dead here too. But they were on the very fringes on the south, but all the other graves are male. So that was the first indication to say we're really inside the community. And then it has to do with how you would interpret the buildings and everything else if you decided this is the religious community. But I thought of another thing, go ahead. And I got made fun of for a long time for this. This is down in the settlement. In the scrolls, it says that you have to put the latrines, the toilets, outside the camp, 2,000 cubits to the northwest. Sanitation, the wind, and just the idea of spiritual holiness. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, some of you might know the Old Testament, that's specifically specified that the toilets, the latrines have to be outside the camp. Some of you might know in the Middle Ages when the Black Death was sweeping Europe, it did not affect Jewish communities because they had these sanitation rules in the Jewish ghetto about human waste and refuse being taken out of the living area. And that's how the disease was spreading. A lot of Christians said, oh, the devil's helping those Jews. Uh, you know, they, they don't get these diseases, but now we have another explanation. So I decided years ago, I, we should go looking for the latrines. So I would give lectures on this and talk about it, and people started calling me, you know, Tabor, he's that toilet guy, he's looking for the toilets, you know, the ancient toilets, okay? So this is the area that I identified. Go back one slide, Lori. Uh, see that bluff right there? Like this is a settlement. And right there is, I, I, I'm up behind that. And one of the, go ahead, for it. And one of the things the scroll says, it needs to be out of view of the camp. So outside the camp, 2,000 cubits, out of the view, northwest, it's a no-brainer. I mean, why didn't anybody else think of this? I don't know. So I thought of it. So I took my students, and we went, and we got an anthropologist, Josias, 
and we dug all, we, we did test areas all over, including this area, next. And you can see some of the, the, the settlements down there. And these are some of our samples that we took. And we took about 20 soil samples. And uh, as Joe said, it's, it's basically a toxic waste dump because you have about 200 years of people. What they would do is they would go outside the camp, they would dig a hole with a shovel. This little ax was actually this, this for the digging. And they would cover up the excrement. And then, uh, you know, over the years, it sort of builds up. We also found tapeworms, uh, the larva of tapeworms uh, desiccated. But so we're thinking that uh, they're probably getting these in their toes, you know, the sandals, wearing sandals, and then many, many years of this. So it probably wasn't a very healthy practice. Anyway, once that was published, it seemed like with the graves and now the latrines, it was pretty well agreed that, so you see how science could help actually say that the scrolls had to do with this community. It's kind of a simple thing, but the idea would be sometimes you find things and other times you go looking for things. I went looking for the latrines because of a text. You see the idea? Other times you could come across a structure and you don't know what it is. And then you would try to see if there is a text that would explain what it is. So text and material evidence work hand in hand. If you find a cemetery, you're naturally going to say, what is this place? Where, where are we? Who, who was buried here? You see, it has a history. Well, often at most church cemeteries here in South Carolina, you're going to have registries, right? Going back in family records. And that's how genealogists do a lot of their work. Because you got the tombstones and you got the written records and so forth. Do you see how the, the material evidence works with the textual evidence? Okay, next. Now, that's come wrong. Now to the John the Baptist cave. This was the cover of Bar Magazine. Uh, I can't see the year, 204 it looks like. John the Baptist has his cave been found. Now you've got to understand that's a screaming headline. That's almost National Enquirer stuff. Because first of all, nothing's ever been found that's actually related to John the Baptist. I mean, we have texts in the Bible, but to say you've got something that related to him directly, like his cave, you know, what do you mean? The editor is asking that skeptically, Herschel Shanks, has his cave been found? I don't think so, but this is where we first published uh, our results. Okay, next. The cave, here's the old city of Jerusalem. You saw the aerial shot before. If you take, if you go uh, west instead of east, the Dead Sea is this way, and you take this winding road out to Ein Karim, which is the town of John the Baptist, the cave is right over here. You'll see it in a minute, at a place called Suba. Next. This is what it looks like. It's called Suba because of the swelling. Suba means to swell. And it's mentioned in the Old Testament, the town of Suba, the town of the swelling earth. And the cave is just to the foot where I'm pointing right here. And Ein Karim is right there where John the Baptist grew up. We're pretty sure the tradition that he grew up there is solid. There's churches all over. It's like saying Jesus is from Bethlehem or something or Nazareth. You know, that's not hard to establish. But this cave is what's interesting. Okay, next. This is Dr. Gibson and me looking a lot thinner and younger and darker and more fit and tan and wonderful. Uh, that was in the year 2000, so it's been a while. Uh, and we are taking our students and beginning to dig this cave. Notice, uh, next. This is our team of UNC Charlotte students, next. And here we are in the morning eating our breakfast at four o'clock, heading out to dig this cave. Next. And this is what it looked like. You had to bend down to crawl in. And we didn't know how deep it was. We didn't know what would be in it. It's really kind of an exciting adventure. Why would we even dig a cave? Well, first of all, it's near Ein Karim, so that's interesting. Uh, I used to joke before we found what we found, which I'll tell you in a minute. Well, any kid that grew up in Ein Karim, if there's a cave like this, the kid's going to play in the cave. So at least John the Baptist played in this cave because he's a kid, right? <laughs> so, you know, I can't prove that. Uh, but we didn't know how deep it would be. And look, we're just in there and we're hitting our heads and beginning to remove the soil. Next. But on the wall, 
is the earliest image of John the Baptist. He's got his hand up, he's holding a stick, he's got this kind of uh, wrapped around hair. I don't know if you know much about him, but he was what's called a Nazarite. He never cut his hair, so he finally has to wrap his hair around in this big braid, kind of like Rasta kind of thing, really big headdress. And then you can't see it real good in this picture, there'll be some more, but his, his uh, coat is hacked to show that, it, that it's camel hair. So we're pretty sure, you know, you find an image like this at Ein Kerem in a cave a few hundred meters from where he grew up. Somebody's remembering John the Baptist. We're not sure of how to date the image, but it's definitely the earliest image of John the Baptist, which is pretty exciting. Imagine if it had been Jesus. Can you imagine the headlines? Okay. Oh, by the way, go back one. I have to tell you about this student. No, go back to the, no. Yeah, this too. She's my favorite. She came. She joined us, and uh, I. I said, "Well, you want to go in and help the boys? They're moving the dirt." She goes, "Well, I'm not going in that cave." And I said, "Well, you came on this dig. Why are you not going in the cave?" She goes, "I didn't think we'd have to go in it." So I always remember that story. So, but anyway, she ended up. She's in there, and she's digging away, and she's doing great. Okay, next. So. For after we went during spring break 2000 and then we got the surprise of our lives on the Sunday of do you have a week spring break here we just we have a week so we get like a Monday through a Friday so we took the weekend the five days and then the weekend we're supposed to fly back Sunday night and so Sunday we're digging Sunday up to the last minute because we got to go back and have class on Monday and get home overnight and we hit this hordes and hordes of first century pottery, first century AD, we can identify this pottery. And so we were just blown away. And I called our chancellor and I said, you know, we were digging Byzantine, which is fourth century, and we were dealing medieval, getting down, but now we're getting down in the cave. And all of a sudden, we're, it's all first century. It's all from the time of John the Baptist. Meaning these pots and so forth are from that time. And the chancellor said, stay another week. I'll take care of your classes. You know, he, back in those days. Can you do that? No. Paul, don't worry. They're doing important things. Next. <laughs> uh, as we got down, one of the things we found is this little uh, carved uh, area that fits your right foot and it's got a little basin. And it's not a natural phenomenon. It's cut into the bedrock. So we think they were anointing uh, their right foot with probably oil. Next. And this is how we reconstruct what they were doing. They would come in, they would anoint and then baptize in this cave. And this shelf is where you put your clothing because you baptize naked. And so this is a place of baptism associated with John the Baptist from the first century because of the pottery. Next. Now, before, when I showed you that slide, we were up here, look. Look at this, we were up here. Look at this. That's how much we dug. Now, we didn't do that in those two weeks. This was over the next two years. We had no idea that there were the beautiful 12 steps going down. This is an amazing place. It's plastered, it's beautiful. Next. And this, we left this. Archaeologists always leave for the future. So, but that's a sliced cake, and this is the bottom of the cave. We left this and we left this. This is not here anymore. We left this for the future, because that's got the stratigraphy of the whole history of the cave. And later people have better scientific methods than we have. Next. And this is what it looks like when it fills up with water. Next. And that's the beautiful entrance. You couldn't even see that when we went in. We had just crawled in there. Next. And so here was the puzzle. You have, this is where we first started, Byzantine, early Roman, and then you get first century. This is like a meter and a half of uh, fill during the first century. So it's getting very heavy use in the first century for baptism. And uh, therefore we think it, it is associated with John the Baptist. Now, uh, John the Baptist is baptizing in the New Testament at the River Jordan, not at Ein Kerem where he grew up. So what is this? 
We think it's a local ritual pool for immersion that everybody's using, but later it's remembered as the pool that John the Baptist would have used. That's our guess, and that's why you have the graffiti. Next. The graffiti actually tells a story. There's our little guy, our little figure. This is a Mandean. The Mandeans follow John the Baptist. They live in Iraq, and that this is uh, the way they represent John the Baptist. Notice that looks just like this right here. So we made that association. This is the head of John the Baptist. Uh, what you've got is a kind of a story of how he came and preached, and then he was beheaded, and then his followers were next. And that's maybe the best picture. See how his little coat is hacked there? This was probably a relic, maybe his finger or something part of him. Unfortunately, there was nothing. We never found any anything in there. Uh, the Muslims later took over, and they were iconoclasts, and they hacked his face. They hacked his nose and hacked his face away because they didn't believe you should have images. This is his little uh, little basin that he would use. The people would go in the water, and then you would pour water over the head and dip them down under. Next. So that, those are my first two examples of just how you can be, you can know of somebody from a text and maybe find a location and then maybe identify something about them and learn more from archaeology. So the text informs the archaeology, the archaeology informs the text. But what I must work on now are tombs in Jerusalem. And uh, this major book by Cloner and Zisu, The Necropolis of Jerusalem, Here's the old city of Jerusalem, and all these are tombs all around Jerusalem that have been found mostly by building, by building projects, okay? So they're, they're being found, people building condos, and you're building roads and so forth. And these are cave burials, and they're from the first century. They're all from the first century. First century means C-E, A-D, uh, for Christians, time of Jesus, okay? Uh, so far, 900 cave tombs and more than two to 3,000 ossuaries. You say, how could it be that far off? You know, two or three, that's a lot. Because a lot have been stolen, looted. Some of them are in people's homes all over the world. But we got 2,000 in the state collection of Israel, plus some of the churches have them. And these ossuaries, I'll show you what they are in a minute. They're bone boxes, and this is where we're going to get our stats for the ancient world because you put the names of the deceased on the boxes. You see where I'm going here? So if you have a family tomb, you can look at what names were in that family, and then you can talk about name frequency. And one of the questions is, do you ever find a tomb that could be identified with a known historical figure? That would be exciting. And the answer is yes. Several times uh, this has happened. Um, the 600 of the, of of these uh, 2,000 that we have are inscribed, that's a pretty high number, to have 600 out of 2,000 inscribed. And uh, this is the source for it. Next. Now, the first tomb that in Jerusalem that I came across uh, before I even started doing what I'm doing now with uh, the tomb I'm going to tell you about, accidental. Um, I wrote a book called The Jesus Dynasty, and it starts by saying most of the great archaeological discoveries are accidental. If you go looking, you won't find it. When you're not even expecting, there it is. So that Suba group that was digging the John the Baptist cave, one afternoon on a Friday, about this time of day, Shimon Gibson said, do you guys want to hike in the Hinnom Valley south of Jerusalem? There's a bunch of old tombs, and we'll just learn about tombs and a lot of them are open and abandoned it'll be interesting they're from the first century you know learn the architecture and what they're like and we came across we were right up here uh, because this tomb goes down in a shaft with three levels and this is the lower shaft that you see the cutaway and it had been freshly robbed it's against the law to open these tombs i mean very severe penalties because the, some of these tombs have not been opened for two thousand years and so they're a national treasure, but they do occasionally get looted by locals. And the people think they're going to go in and find something valuable and maybe sell it to tourists or whatever. There's nothing in a Jewish tomb that you could really sell 
other than pieces of the ossuaries, as I'll show you in a minute. Uh, because there's no gold, there's no silver. You might find one coin that somebody dropped when they were burying a relative. Uh, maybe an oil lamp. It's not worth robbing a tomb. But anyway, this one was robbed. And we, we called the Israel Antiquities Authority. And then we said, well, can we go in uh, and check out the damage? And, and it's Friday. I don't know if you know about the Sabbath. But Friday night, Israel shuts down by 2 o'clock. They don't want to leave their houses now and go back to work. They're off you know, Friday and Saturday. And so they said, well, why don't you guys check it out? You know, you're archeologists, you can report to us Sunday what you find. So we went down in there. I wasn't sure we should do it because I was worried that my chancellor might say, you know, are you sure you're supposed to go into an, a tomb that's been robbed? I mean, you know, is that a crime scene or what? But anyway, Shimon goes, no, no, we're going in, come on. It's an adventure, so we went in. And we got down to this lower part. There's an ossuary. I'll show you lots more ossuaries. Bone box. They're limestone cut out of solid limestone. But in this niche right here, we find the intact skeleton of a shrouded body. When we found that, we were so shocked because it shouldn't exist after 2,000 years. All the bodies decompose. They just become a pile of bones. It just looks like almost just debris. And yet this guy is fairly intact. You can, you can literally see. And he's got a shroud, which is cloth. Well, no burial shroud has ever been found from this period in Jerusalem. And of course, I'm thinking, I work on Jesus, right? I'm thinking, hmm, not that it's Jesus, but the stories. They wrapped him in a shroud and placed him in a tomb, dug out of rock. Have we found a first century shroud? You know, possibly. So we were pretty excited. We called the Israelis back, and guess what? They got down there real fast. <laughs> Why we told them that? First of all, they didn't believe it. They said, nah, you're, it's probably newspaper, burnt newspaper. Probably people got in and they, they left trash. Gibson said, just come. I, you know, he's had a lot of experience. Okay, next. This is what it looks like when you sliver on down into the tomb. Next. And here I am in my beautiful coach jacket. My wife, Lori, practically killed me for doing this and I had to go in. Um, what did that jacket cost, Lori? Anyway, <laughs> so I'm climbing in and out of the tomb. I was actually with Kathy Reichs when this was taken. Kathy Reichs, the, the uh, creator of Bones and the forensic anthropologist at UNC Charlotte. Uh, she took that picture. She thought it was really funny that I was wearing my nice jacket. But anyway, next. And this is, uh, when you get down inside, this is what our guy looked like. Uh, these are the best preserved parts of the shroud, but you can find remnants of all of it, and especially the headpiece. Next. This is his hair. That's, those are pieces of his skull. So suddenly we have the only burial shroud ever found from the first century, and the only male Jewish hair. There was some female hair found at Masada, one of the women of the skeletons at Masada, some of you know about Masada, was a woman's hair braided still, looks like, but that was in the desert. Jerusalem's not the desert. Jerusalem has as much rain as we get here in the Carolinas, uh, and so it shouldn't have been preserved. So we figured out the reason this guy was preserved is there was a blocking stone sealing that niche because he had leprosy, Hansen's disease. This so suddenly we've made this triple discovery. You say, well, leprosy, I've heard of that. In the Bible, you read about leprosy, but all the scholars said that's just psoriasis or some skin disease. It's not true leprosy. There's no proof of leprosy actually existing in the ancient Near East during the time of Jesus. And now we got a guy from the first century, and he's got the bacteria of so-called Hansen's disease, eating away his bones. That's why they sealed him. That's why the water didn't get to him and the moisture. And so he basically was in a, an airtight vault for 2,000 years. I did have the cloth carbon dated, of course, because everybody that hears about these sensational discoveries is going to say, oh, yeah, well, maybe that's a medieval burial. They could have reused the tomb. How are you going to prove it's first century? 
and get this, it came out 30 AD plus or minus 15. That's good enough for me. So this is a first century guy. Uh, those of you who know the Gospels might be interested to learn that this burial shroud has two pieces. It has a headpiece and a body piece. And this is mentioned in the Gospel of John, that Jesus is wrapped in a shroud and the headpiece was separate. So it just shows that the person who wrote that knows the tradition. The Shroud of Turin people were very devastated by this discovery because this shroud is nothing like the Shroud of Turin at all. In weave, in fabric, in style, it's got a different kind of a cloth weave. Doesn't mean you couldn't have had another kind of shroud, but the point is everybody wanted the Shroud of Turin to be Jesus' shroud, if you know about it. You can Google it and find, read all about it. A lot of people think it's so proven. But uh, our shroud is a first century shroud, and it's nothing like that. That's that full body shroud that you would wrap over. As far as I know, that wasn't the way they did it. Okay? So here's a reenactment. We did this for a film we did. Go ahead, Lori. That's what it would look like. See the headpiece separate? That's my friend Rafi. Now I asked the question, do you ever find, like we don't know this guy's name, we know he had leprosy, uh, male hair, by the way, no lice in his hair, and it's cut uh, and styled. It actually had a nice style to it. So he's probably wealthy, maybe a priest, we're not sure. Uh, other ossuaries were found in the tomb, and we do have some names from this tomb. Anyway, this one doesn't look very impressive. Next. But this is actually the, a bone box that has written on the side. It looks, this is kind of graffiti writing, but if you know Hebrew, it's not hard to read at all. It says, Yosef bar, bar Kaffa. Joseph Bar Kaffa, Joseph, son of Caiaphas. I don't know how well you know your New Testament, but this is like a bingo. This is the guy that presided over the trial of Jesus mentioned in the Gospels. So maybe you haven't heard this yet. It's on display in the Israel Museum. But Joseph Caiaphas' ossuary, with his bones in it, were discovered by a bulldozer in the 1990s as they were building a road north of Jerusalem. Next, look how beautiful that is. So this is definitely a rich man, high priest. There's the inscription. So these bone boxes become quite interesting. Next. This is what they look like. I don't want to be here too macabre here, but uh, when you first put the body in, you lay the body out for a year to a year and a half, people usually say a year. And in, the, in this kind of climate, the skin and the organs deteriorate. Uh, you cover it with spices because of the smell. You seal the tomb up. It's a limestone cave. It's been dug out of bedrock. And you put... Uh, the body out on a shelf. It's, it's called a, a arcosolium. And then you gather the bones and put them in an ossuary. So you can see here, it's the width of a skull and the length of a femur. And you can see the femur bones there. So you can usually tell the height of the person. Uh, not that everybody fit exactly, but certainly a small child is going to have a little one, and then an adolescent child, and then a full adult, and so forth. So that even tells you a little bit about the deceased. After uh, a few centuries, this is what it starts looking like. You just get more and more deterioration. But in terms of DNA, you couldn't have a better sample. That's really well preserved. There's going to be teeth in there. The teeth are going to be intact. It's the best way to get DNA is from teeth. And so the possibilities of doing DNA so when we discovered that shroud tomb, I'm going to call it the shroud tomb, not Joe, I didn't discover Caiaphas' tomb, a bulldozer found that one. But when we discovered the shroud tomb, we did DNA on everyone in that tomb for the first time. We have a DNA profile of the family in the shroud tomb for the first time. Now, we don't know how to match up all the names because the robbers kind of broke all the ossuaries and scattered the bones. But we, we know there were 17 separate individuals by studying the bones, and we got DNA profiles of mitochondrial, not Y, but mitochondrial, and, and they're pretty good. So that gives us a beginning little base of a Jewish family in the first century with their DNA. 
So then the question becomes, will we ever find other tombs? And nobody had ever thought of doing DNA, and it's actually allowed by rabbinic law. The rabbis do not want you taking bones, and you have to turn them over and rebury them, like all these bones have been reburied, because you've got to show respect for the dead. But it's allowable by Jewish law to identify a corpse or a body, because that's seen to be an honor. You're identifying the person, so you're remembering them, right? And so you're allowed to take DNA samples. Nobody had ever done it. Shimon Gibson and I were the first ones to ever do it. Uh, Andrew probably knows where that article's published, but I could send you the link if some of you want to read it, of all the things that we did. So now we're wanting to build a DNA base for first century Jerusalem, as we want to do all the ossuaries, all the bones that we can get. Okay, next. Uh, this is, that's a Google shot that doesn't show very well on that slide, but here's the old city. Can you make that out from where you are? And south of the old city was this tomb found right here in a place called Calpio. It's a neighborhood. Next. Here's a, uh, a clearer map of uh, two tombs. One I'm calling the garden tomb, the other the patio tomb. These are also tombs all around. It had been discovered, they're condo buildings here now. And these tombs, particularly this garden tomb, is of special interest because it has in it a family and a set of names that reminds us very closely of the family of Jesus. So it is a Jesus family, but is it Jesus of Nazareth or not? For some Christians, that would be a theological problem. His bones went to heaven, right, or something of that sort. But for anthropologists, you study what's there. Next. That's where, if I'm standing here in Jerusalem, and that's just to show you how far away it is as the crow flies, that's where this tomb is found. Next. This is a, just a close-up of, that's the uh, Jesus tomb, and that's what's called the patio tomb. Now, this is under a building. This is in a garden. So I call this the garden tomb, the patio tomb. I did not discover these. They were discovered in 1980, 1981 by building crews, and then they were just covered over and forgotten. But what we did find is the list of the names of the ossuaries that were in there, and the cluster of names is what began to interest us. Now, this would be in the year 2000, so we're a little late. 1980, 2000, and now we're beginning to look at these things. Yeah. This is what the tomb looked like in its day, the Jesus tomb. You can see it's kind of nice, it's well carved, you go inside, next. Uh, there I am standing outside what it looks like today. Uh, you can't see that entrance, it's down about six feet, but you can see it's kind of a garden, next. And this would be a schematic drawing of what it's like. So this would be the entrance, and look at the ossuaries, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten ossuaries, Six are inscribed. That's a very high ratio. Six are inscribed. You know, usually if, if you say 2,000 and you have 600, it's not quite half. This is over half. Okay, next. These are those ossuaries from that tomb. They're actually on tour right now. This, the reason that uh, picture is out of focus is it's actually a panorama picture, so you need to look at it that way. And these are now in San, they're in uh, Boulder, no, they're in uh, Denver with the Dead Sea Scroll exhibit right now. And they're not on display because of anything to do with our study, but the person who put together the Dead Sea Scroll exhibit was told he could order 10 ossuaries as a sample of Jewish burial, and he was sort of devilish, and he knew about our work, and he goes, I'm gonna order the ossuaries from that Jesus tomb. And they're all now in the United States doing a tour. They've been to several cities uh, for the last 10 years. They've been on tour. So whoever this Jesus is, he's traveling, right? Okay, thanks. This is the Jesus ossuary. I know that looks like a bunch of scratches to you, but uh, let me zoom in on that for a minute. Go ahead, Lori. That's actually what it looks like. That's, uh, I don't know, most of you probably don't know Hebrew, but it says, Jesus, son of Joseph. Next. So the question, here are the other names. So the question is, and this is where we get to the stats, uh, what is the probability that in first century Jerusalem, estimating 50,000 individuals over a 
a generation, uh, that you would have a cluster of names, Jesus, son of Joseph, Yose, Maria, Mariamne, also known as Our Lady, Matya, and Yehuda bar Yeshua, uh, Jude, son of Jesus. Uh, next. What I argued uh, uh, is, uh, this goes to your hypothesis, is I said, well, let's imagine a first century uh, tomb of Jesus and his family who would be in it according to the customs of, of Jewish law and so forth. And he would be in it as head of the family, uh, possibly Joseph, his father, if he was around, Mary, his mother, any wife or children of Jesus and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon and Jude, with any of their wives and children and his sisters, if unmarried. If his sister had two sisters, if the sisters were married, they would be in their husband's tombs. So basically it's a male dominated practice, but this would be a hypothetical Jesus tomb. Just not talking about that, that Talpio tomb, but like any tomb. This is theoretically what could be on a Jesus tomb. Let me deal quickly with the theological thing. Uh, for some people to even talk about a Jesus tomb is blasphemy because Jesus was raised from the dead and he went to heaven. But the problem with that is not believing in the resurrection, but whether the early Christian view was that the resuscitated corpse of Jesus actually went to heaven because Paul talks about the resurrection as a spiritual body, not a physical body. And he actually says the physical body you leave behind is clothing. He says that in 2 Corinthians 5. He says you strip off your old body and you have a new body. He also talks about the future resurrection. Christian hope. When Jesus returns, he's going to raise the dead that are in the sea. In the sea, the ocean. Obviously, you're not looking for body parts. So it is possible that early Christians did not see resurrection as the corpse walking out as much as some revivified spiritual body or something of that sort. But either way, I mean, if we're dealing with science, we actually don't have to consider theology, but obviously it comes to people's minds. Next. Uh, you guy, you know this guy, Andrew Sills, you know him? Uh, he did something, you should look this up. Uh, he's got it on, on your website, but it was published in a volume. Uh, and I want to show you how you can work with these stats. Okay, the apostles and brothers of Jesus. Next. He and I started talking, and I had a hypothesis that if you name the 12 apostles, uh, that there are three that nobody can name. And for years I've offered uh, to my students in Christian Origins, a class I teach, if you can name all 12 apostles, I'll take you to dinner. I spring it on them, you know. And some of them can get Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Some of you grew up in church that might say, you know, Peter, Andrew, James, John. And then they go like, oh, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, right? And Matthew. And then Judas is scary. Yeah, he's the bad guy. That's all anybody ever gets. What they never get are these last three. James, the son of Alphaeus, a Simon, and a Jude. Well, the brothers of Jesus are James, Simon, and Jude, right? Those are their names. Now, they're common names, sort of common. We'll see in a minute. But how common, right? And so Andrew wrote a paper, and you can look it up because I don't have time to summarize it all. But he kind of ingeniously did his stats on what are the probabilities that you would have these three names come up in a list of the 12, and also as brothers of Jesus, and he concludes statistically that my hypothesis that the brothers of Jesus are part of the 12 is, you know, pretty strong, right? Pretty probable. Next. So Jerusalem was destroyed, all the burials stopped. Next. I've got to go fast here. But what we have, based on all of our ossuaries and inscriptions, and these are all the occurrences of these names, is we get percentages of the names. And this is where some of you stats people can start working. I was on NPR when all this was coming out in 206, and as you can imagine, it's pretty controversial. 
And so I said, I was on Diane Reem's show, and I said, uh, you know, my wife, Lori, and just taking our first names, my name is James. If I want to use my nickname as a kid, Jimmy, it's more unusual. And then my two kids, uh, Eve and Seth, I said, my guess is there's no other family of four in the whole United States that has those four names. James is pretty common. Lori's slightly common. Eve is not so common. And again, you throw in Seth. You see what you get. So the question is, clusters of names are not the same as names, and especially if you have a James, because James is pretty rare. Look at that, 1.6, very rare. So uh, these are the most common names right here, and for Mary. Okay, next. So if you have a stadium uh, with 50,000 people, this is just to imagine, it's not exactly the stats, uh, and you ask all the males named Yeshua stand up, you're going to get uh, quite a few, 2,796 will stand. How many of you have a father named Joseph? The rest of you sit down, now you got 300. And that's a common name. How many of you have a mother named Mary? Now we're down to just 173. Does anybody have a brother named James? Remember, that's 1.6. All of a sudden, less than one person's there. You go, yeah, I knew a guy, but he didn't come to the stadium today. He's got a brother named James. You see what happens. So this is what we have to explain to people. Everybody you talk to will say, the names are the most common. Don't talk about this being the Jesus tomb because the names are common. Okay, next. The other tomb, I got to really hurry here, well, is under the patio. Go ahead, Lori. And we actually, here's our license, go ahead. And we had to go in with the robotic camera to get into it. Why did we want to go in the other tomb? Because it's just 60 meters from this tomb. It's on the same burial plot. So we just thought, you know, maybe it's connected to the family. Now it's never been excavated. See, and here's our team from National Geographic and we're going in, next. And we found all, we found some really interesting things. Can you imagine this is like, landing on the moon or something, you've got this robotic camera and you're going in and looking at these things that have not been seen for 2,000 years. And our camera was able to get around and, and see them. And this is one of the things we found. This fish with, uh, looks like uh, something coming out of its mouth. And right here it says in Hebrew, Jonah, Yonah. Now, I don't know if you know the story of Jonah vomiting up uh, the whale, or the fish, it's not a whale, a fish vomiting up Jonah, that becomes the main symbol of Christian resurrection. Jews never use the Jonah story for resurrection. They actually use it uh, to talk about, for Yom Kippur, to talk about your sins, because Jonah ran away from God. It's actually a bad text. Christians use it for resurrection, because Jonah was swallowed by a fish, vomited out, so he's kind of raised from the dead, right? And so this has never been seen on a Jewish tomb. We're 60 meters from the Jesus tomb, and somebody's celebrating resurrection of the dead. You see that? And this is quoted in the Gospels, where Jesus says, uh, the only sign will be the sign of Jonah, talking about resurrection of the dead. Now this, we don't know what's there. That's blank because... Another ossuary was in front of that, and we could see the border, and so we just left it blank. We're going to go back in that tomb, I hope, someday, actually go in and not do the robotic tomb. Next. Uh, there's Jonah written very clearly. If you know Hebrew, it's a no-brainer. Now, why does, is that Jonah? If this is the first Jonah image ever made, we don't know what Jonah's going to look like, but he looks like a ball of thread. <laughs> And it says in the Bible, when he was vomited out, he was rolled into a ball of seaweed. So I think the artist is just trying to reflect the text. So yeah, it's Jonah wrapped up in the vomity seaweed of the fish's belly. You see? Okay, next. And then there was an inscription next to it with the ossuary, O divine Jehovah, lift up, lift up. Lift up, lift up the dead. Never found a resurrection inscription in any Jewish tomb. Next. So this is what a, an ossuary looks like when you clean all the DNA out. I mean, all the bones out. 
still plenty of human remains. So we have the possibility of doing DNA on all of the ossuaries in Jerusalem. Uh, we're, we're going to start this project so that we can actually finally have these family relationships of who's related to whom and so forth, plus correlating all the names. It's going to be a huge mathematical project, as you can imagine. Next. Here are some of the DNA samples. We did do Jesus and the Maria. Next. And we found that they are not maternally related, so she is either his sister or she could be uh, his... Jesus had three Marys in his life, his mother, his sister, and Mary Magdalene. So this could be Mary Magdalene, or it could be some other woman named Mary Magdalene. But she is called Amara, which means something like the lady. Okay, next. Sounds like Da Vinci Code stuff, right? Now, finally, Yose is a rare nickname for Jesus' brother. It's used in Mark 6, verse 3, that actual form, Yose. It's only found one other time in any inscription, ossuary, any other kind of inscription anywhere. Joseph is common, but Yose, that nickname Yose is very rare. And yet it is the nickname of Jesus' brother. Maria, uh, possibly the mother, we don't know. We got a Matya and then we got a Yehuda. This was a problem because Jesus shouldn't be having children if he's living a celibate life, which most people assume. But I think now people are questioning whether, as a Jew in the first century, he might have also had children. So uh, next, I think, go ahead, I'm going to skip that for now. One other thing I've got to throw in at the end here. There's another ossuary right here that surfaced in the year 2002. Next. There it is. And it says, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And it's very controversial, and there was a trial about whether it had been forged, and the owner was acquitted of forgery, and most of us who work on this are convinced that it's authentic. Next. And there's the inscription, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Next. And the question is, where did it come from? Because it simply showed up on the antiquities market uh, sometime around 1980 when this tomb was discovered. And so now, several scientists in Israel are doing soil tests on the ossuaries, not patina, but soil. Because when limestone sits in a certain soil environment for 2,000 years, it absorbs the chemicals of the soil. And you can have a tomb 60 meters away and it'll have a different signature, just because of the geology of Jerusalem. And so now uh, R.A. Shimron is heading the project. He's done 60 tombs, 60 tombs, and he's running soil tests on all of them. And the preliminary results show that the James Ossuary came from this tomb. If you add the James Ossuary to that cluster, then the stats go up off the roof, that this is most likely the tomb of Jesus uh, the Jesus of, of, of Nazareth. So uh, it's kind of an explosive idea, but who knows? Next, I think that's it. I wrote a book on this, I brought a copy. I don't sell the books, but if you're interested in reading, it's a very well-documented, thorough book, and you could order that and read all about it. Okay, so I went a little bit over time, I think, uh, but if you have some questions, we can, uh, Take some extra time. I think you all realize that if this was Socrates' tomb or Alexander the Great or Caiaphas or anybody but Jesus, I would be, people would be applauding and praising uh, us for this discovery. But because it's Jesus, you have this other problem. You say, well, you can't have this tomb because he was raised from the dead. So that's why I put in that little caveat about Paul's view of resurrection. Because, uh, Any questions? Like, what kind of statistical method should we employ? Have you employed any statistical methods? Yeah. Um, the, uh, Andrew can give you the reference, but Floyd Berger's work, I think, is the main thing. 
Yeah, I actually shared that paper with you when we first started talking about yeah. inviting James to come out here. I know He's done the most on it, and uh, it's a very thorough study. It's more mathematical. Can I? I can follow, but I'm sure you you, you would uh, you could look at it again if you don't. If, uh, but he's published, and it has five responses from statisticians as well. And what it's in the Journal of Applied Statistics. Journal of Applied Statistics, yeah. probably about 10 years ago now. Yeah. So uh, that, that's the main work that's been done. Also, uh, Jerry Lutkin uh, has done a lot of work on it. His material is all archived at a website called BibleInterp.com. I-N-T-E-R-P, and that's really useful. He has an article called Talpio Tomb, What Are the Odds, and things like that, where he gets into the variables. So I can't really follow it that much, because once I see those equations, I kind of glaze over, but Andrew helps me to figure some of that out. Any other questions? On our DNA uh, tests so far, we've got about 40 people, 40 individuals tested so far. We're getting, it's, there's some still a kind of small community, you know, I mean, over this period. The shroud tomb, two individuals at the shroud tomb are maternally rated, related to people at Masada. So that was kind of interesting. And let's see, what else do we have? There's a, there's a Hashmanian king, his name is Antigonus. His tomb was also found in Jerusalem. Uh, he's the last Hashmanian king of the Maccabees. And his DNA seems to relate also to someone at Masada. So I think we're gonna get more and more of these kind of webbed relationships as we can, uh, what we do is we scrape these ossuaries. They, you saw that one picture. Uh, nobody, what they do is they just basically dump it and maybe brush it out just a little bit just for, but if you go to the Israel Museum and look in any of the ushers, you'll be shocked. You'll see pieces of bone on the side. They haven't scraped it all out, it's there. Teeth, bones, small fragments. So DNA can be done on every one of those ushers, and then you, we could come up with a kind of a profile of all these relationships. So you almost never get Y unless you have a tooth. And that's too bad. Mitochondrial is great, but also be good to have some Y come through. Yeah. When, I had a question. When you do the DNA testing, do the rabbis allow you to leave with it, or does the testing have to be there? And the rabbis get involved? Yeah, they do get involved. You can take a sample. Well, these ossuaries that have the remains, they've already turned those over. They don't, to them, that's done. We took the bones. And they don't take a spatula and remove all that. And it's very encrusted material. It's also seeped into the limestone, the body fluids. There's a lot of DNA. Now, it's paleo DNA. Paleo DNA is deteriorating. But you usually can get you know, uh, position, you know, you might get 20 or 30 positions with two or three polymorphisms. So you, you know, you get enough to begin talking about this person is related to this person, or often not related because of the difference. Yeah. Yes? How did you identify the mycobacterium DNA to say this was That wasn't, uh, I didn't do that, but, uh, the biologist did it. She, first, she noticed that some of the bones in the tomb that she was gathering had the signs of the Hansen's disease. Are you a biologist? Maybe you know how that looks. Is it, is it little, uh, yeah, like little things eaten away? Yeah. yeah. And then she, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know exactly how, it, well, she identified that as the sign of this bacteria. Okay. But whether she actually found uh, like you're looking at mitochondrial DNA, you could PCR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think she did identify, she had to identify what it was. Because it changed the whole field that if you look it up now in the right sources, it's now admitted that Hansen's disease is in the Middle East. 
and it was thought to have not been there until the 19th century. So we know it was there anciently as well. So. Okay, right. thanks. There's no further questions. Let's thank our speaker once again.